keeping an eye on Carolina. All right. So I know Duke and State played last night. We'll talk about State here in a second. But Carolina is this team that's like in some and not in others. I know uh, Joe Lenardi has them as the first team out. Where do you have the Tar Heels going into this game against the Devils? Just inside the field, last spot inside the field. So very, very close. Uh, I think you could make a case either way. And the case is basically the same, right? Like you can look at them and say, well, they haven't messed up a whole lot and they have the one high-end win that they just picked up the other day against Virginia. Uh, and then the other side of that is they only have the one high-end win. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I, I think that's a team that still has work to do here over the next week and a half or so, obviously with Duke coming in to the Dean Dome on Saturday and then also at the ACC tournament. For sure, we can sit here and say that, that they're going to have to win at least one game in Greensboro uh, to feel safe, no matter what, and quite possibly two. One of the things, Patrick, that people get confused about when we talk about teams on the bubble is they think, oh, well, we're going to compare North Carolina or NC State or Clemson to Kansas and their mm-hmm. resume. Oh, we're going to compare them to Purdue or someone from the big, the one of the leaders from the Big Ten. No, you're, you're compared to the other teams that are on the bubble. Just like bracket luck is real, I, I'm convinced bubble luck is real too. So who are some of the teams on the bubble that NC State, Clemson, North Carolina will be compared to? Yeah, I, I think you you can start off with a couple Big 12 teams. West Virginia and Oklahoma State are in that mix. I think you have Michigan and Penn State and Wisconsin out of the Big 10. Those are a handful of teams to be aware of. Nevada, I, I think Boise State less so than, than it would seem some other people. I think Boise's a little bit safer, especially after last night. Uh, but those would be some teams that certainly stand out among among some others. Utah State's a team to keep an eye on potentially if, if, if they can make a run here in the last week or so and make a push to the Mountain West final. Arizona State would be in that mix as well. So there's a bunch of them, but it's not as large a group as you would normally think just because, uh, you know, this is a year where the, the depth of the field, once you get to a team – 45 or so at you know and the cut line's 36 you know there just isn't a whole lot much beyond the edge of the field right now ah uh, yes that's patrick, where you and patrick pa- are some potty co <laughs> patrick stevens and i this is when when we're not talking about cats we can agree on this uh it's we, we got to fill out the field <laughs> We do. They're going to take 36. They're going to take 36. They're not just going to stay 34 this year. And that's why, you know, when people get on the ACC and not necessarily having a strong season, and nobody's denying that. I'm not trying to deny like the ACC is having some sort of vintage year. But when people start hand wringing about the amount of teams they're going to get in the NCAA tournament, I usually fall back on that. If you think the ACC is down, that's relative to just a good chunk of college basketball. And you got to fill out the field, and that's what will help teams like North Carolina, which have a name brand. Yeah, somebody's got to be there. And you you would think in in a lot of years you'd go, gosh, this would be a great time to have like a mid-major or a a typical two-bid league become a three-bid league. This year, the Missouri Valley and the A-10 are both going to be one-bid leagues. The last time they were both one-bid leagues in the same year was 1990. Oh, wow. So, okay. like, you have that sort of variable in the mix, too. You, you look at the Pac-12, that's probably a three- or four-bid league as opposed to the uh, an opportunistic year where they get up to around six. The American isn't going to be more than a two-bid league unless somebody other than Memphis or Houston wins that conference. So, you know, you're right. They're, somebody's got to fill out the field. They're not going to just have dead air on Tuesday from mm-hmm. when those gate, Dayton games are supposed to be going on. Patrick Stevens handles bracketology for the Washington Post. He is my friend. Joining us here on the OG. All right, Patrick, I, you, I want you to explain this to me in a way. I know you. I know I made you do this to me last year, but again, give it to me again. We don't get the Nets public formula. The NCAA doesn't make the net formula public because... It is a proprietary metric that they paid a lot of money for. <laughs> okay. Right? That's part of it. And the okay. other part of it is, is that... They make the RP. They made the RPI public, which you know it obviously wasn't a very complex formula. And then everybody went and gamed it. Okay. And so if you don't know what the formula is exactly, you can't efficiently game it in terms of your scheduling, uh, in terms of just the way that you decide to play, uh, as opposed to if you know if you do know that, maybe you're intentionally running up the score a little bit. You know, or you're intentionally scheduling a certain kind of team in non-conference play as opposed to just kind of doing what you're doing right now. But does the formula change each year? Is it That's tweaked? a good question. 
I, I think it might be. I think it might be tweaked based on the information that is spit into it. If you recall, when the NCAA announced the net initially, they said something in the release to the effect of this accounts for data from X number of seasons or something like that. Okay. And so it would seem to make sense to me that you would not uh, adjust that a little bit as the data comes in for more recent seasons, right? That makes sense. So I, I don't know 100% for sure that the metric is, is tweaked from year to year. And I don't even know that if it is tweaked, that it's a massive change year over year. But it would make a lot of sense based on those sort of breadcrumbs that you're not dealing with the exact same formula every single season. I don't like that. Yeah, I, I don't get the proprietor. <laughs> I know they paid for it, but give me a break if you think it's been gamed. I get it. We had the... Who was it? Missouri State, the one year that was like twenty-one in the in the RPI and didn't make yeah, the it was tournament. Two thousand six. Yep. There you go. I, it, look, I mean, he's not looking at anything. Him and him and Bo will have these numbers. Yeah, no, they're just like watch. <laughs> How the hell is it? No, I'm just I'm just sad. Patrick Stevens, Washington Post, when we talked about you have to fill out the field and you you see some of these leagues that are not going to be able to have more than one bid. I'm like, does that that, that doesn't bode well for Herb Sendek, does it? Are we going to get Santa no. Clara in this field? We're we getting Santa Clara no, or what? We're see, I don't think we're going to see Santa Clara in the field. Although I will say, one of the most bizarrely interesting teams is another WCC team, Loyola Marymount, mm -hmm. which beat both Gonzaga and St. Mary's. And do, do I remember that they gave Wake that they beat Wake Forest too back in November? They did, and they they also have a scattering of ridiculous losses too. <laughs> uh, so they're Clemson. They're, they're the Clemson of the, they of are the, the West Clemson Coast. Of the West Got Coast. it. Got it. They are Got the Clemson it. of the West Coast. Makes total sense now.